Well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to FPC. If you are online, we welcome you as well. We're in the house of God on this rainy Sunday. But you know, I see rain as a form of blessing. You know, we need the water. We need to just be blessed by the Lord. And I always think rain is the Lord's blessing. So this morning, would you stand and sing Hosanna? Praise is rising with us. Let us just allow the Lord to come in here. Bless the Lord this morning. Praise is rising. of the Lord. It's good to be here during Advent. I love the worship team. I love 
Brian and Samuel. And what I'm really happy about Samuel is I know he's going to get presents this year because he's not naughty. He's nice. <laughs> he put it right on his sweatshirt. I thought, well, that, that encourages people to give you presents, doesn't it? I don't know if I could put nice on a sweatshirt. Or I could, but I don't know if I should wear it. But it's just joyful, especially the Advent of Joy, just to be here and celebrate. See rain outside, and uh, it's good. So let us begin today with our confession, a time of just centering on God, the reason why we're here, the joy that we receive from the Trinity and the community, and just being alive. So let us read and let us believe. I write this, dear children to guide you out of sin. But if anyone does sin, we have a priest friend in the presence of the Father, Jesus Christ, righteous Jesus. When he served as a sacrifice for our sins, he solved the sin problem for good, not only ours, but the whole world's. Here's how we can be sure we know God in the right way. Keep his commandments. If someone claims, I know him well, but doesn't keep his commandments, this person is obviously a liar. Their life doesn't match their words. But the one who keeps God's word is the person in whom we see God's mature love. This is the only way to be sure we're in God. Anyone who claims to be intimate with God ought to live the same kind of life Jesus lived. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for all the abundance that you bring us. Especially at this time of year, we remember the joy, the love, the peace, and the hope we have in you. Long before we existed, you existed with a plan for us to walk with you and with each other in freedom and wholeness and be delivered. Help us to be lights in the darkness, to bring compassion and love and the joy of the Lord to all we encounter. For your glory and your honor, in your name, amen. We have the Advent reading now. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Why do we light three candles? The first candle is a reminder of the light of hope of the prophets. The second candle is a symbol of the light, warmth and comfort God provided for Joseph and Mary when they were in the stable. The third candle is a symbol of the great light and joy which surrounds the shepherd at the announcement of Jesus' birth. I want to read the, the story of the shepherd's search for the newborn. Um, it's in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. And in the same country there were shepherds living in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And lo, the angel of the Lord came on them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were grievously afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not fear, for behold, I give you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For to you is born today in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this is a sign to you, you will find the babe wrapped, lying in the manger. And suddenly there was the angel, a multitude of heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it happened as the angels departed from them into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, Indeed, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord made known to us. And hurrying, they came and sought out both Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And seeing, they publicly told the words spoken to, to them concerning this child. And all those who heard marveled about the things spoken to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these sayings, meditating in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as was spoken to them. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your gift of Jesus to the whole world. As the shepherds found Jesus in a manger, may we find Jesus in the love and joy that we share together. Help us, O oh God, to love one another. Help us to do our share to bring happiness, goodness, and peace to the world. Amen. Let's sing Away in a Manger together. Um, it's in the hymnal, number 185, verses 1 through 3. Because he was born, because he's born in our hearts and in our lives, we have received amazing grace. Let us not forget that it is the grace of the Lord why we stand, why we are in this place, blessed abundantly. So would you stand and sing with us? This is amazing grace. Rather, grace.
done for me. Yes, the Lord has done great things. 2023 might have been a challenge, but the Lord is with us. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who moves the nations with truth and justice? I like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, oh, the King of all oh, kings. Lord, we can say this is amazing remember how the Lord has just blessed you, made a way, healed you, just worked miracles on our behalves. And I know I'm in, I'm the recipient of that. So this song, O Come All Ye Faithful. Today we are the faithful. We are his remnant. So let us come and worship the Lord. And the biggest gift we can give him is our heart, our hearts in worship, our lives. Let him be the center of your heart, the center of your life. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, ye, oh, come, ye. Of all our praise. 
Today, Lord, we want you to be born in our hearts. We want you to be the king, the sovereign king of our hearts, of our lives. And today, receive our worship. Receive our hearts, Lord, for you are worthy of it all. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him.
worship you, Lord. Please be seated. Good morning. Our first reading this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 40, <clears throat> verses 1 through 5. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, and every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Our second reading is from... Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sunday to come to your house of worship. We thank you for the rain you're giving us today. We pray, God, that as we go into this most holy of seasons for us Christians, that you will watch over us, bless us, and keep us in your hands safely. Let us listen closely to Pastor Dennis this morning as he brings the message, and let us take it to heart. Thank you, God. Amen. I guess somebody else wants to preach. It's okay with me. Um, it's good to be here. It's I love Christmas. Uh, I'm a fanatic, you know, Linda and I watch White Christmas every Christmas Eve for the last probably 35 years, you know, and I love presents, I love to give, uh, uh, I love the holidays, there's just something about magic about Christmas, and that's understandable, especially for us Christians, you know, I mean, I thought about this. We're the ones who really can celebrate Christmas the most. I mean, people can say Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and all that. But we understand what it is about. And I was having lunch last week with somebody, and we were talking about it. And in the Orthodox Church, to them, the great gift from God is the baby Jesus. To Western Christianity, the great gift from God is the atonement the sacrifice, the forgiveness of sins, because we're judicial and we want to be legally declared clean. But to them, it was that God was willing to be incarnate, that he would come as a child. This is mind-blowing to them. And so they're really centered on that. And, you know, I was thinking about this. You know, uh, I was at a party last night and there was a baby there and uh, it was here but until a minute ago. But... Um, you know, babies don't do anything. They eat, sleep, and poop. That's about it. So they don't really, you know, talk intellectually or sing you songs or tell jokes or anything like that. But have you ever watched when one of them is carried into a room? The whole room changes. The joy they bring 
is unbelievable, and they do nothing. They don't do anything. They just, and then everybody, ooh, and stuff. There's something about a child because of its innocence, its purity. It doesn't, you know, it's not always demanding something like verbally. It's just being, and there's something about that that brings people joy. And so when we celebrate the Christ child, it's amplified 10 million times. Because this isn't just a child, and that's what we, we celebrate during Christmas, and that's why we have Advent. And when we've talked about this every week, Advent is coming. Um, in fact, the Latin word is the same Greek word that's used for the second coming of Christ. And so they talk about the coming, and we've said, you know, except for this intermission, we get back to the original story. So during the church time, they talked about three comings. They talked about the coming of the Christ child, the coming of new creation, and finally the second coming of Christ. And this is, those three things really form the idea of Advent, of what are we celebrating during this time, and and we're celebrating this. And so they translated it to hope, peace, joy, and love as those four key things. They're gifts from God. And there's really amazing part is that we still, we are in the middle of the second and third where we have new creation, but we're waiting for the ultimate uh, gift from God, which we really don't understand. I had a teacher, um, Herman Wagen, who was a international Greek scholar, a toughest guy. People didn't even want to take his class because he was so tough. So I became friends with him. And so we were talking about Revelation. And I said, well, you know, the second coming, what, what do you say about that? He goes, listen, so I've taught all over, Tubic and all these places. He said, I've read Revelation. It's about Jesus. He's coming back. There's a new heaven and a new earth. Besides that, I don't know nothing. And it's funny how all these people write how in detail what happens in Revelation. We really don't know. It's a great mystery that God would come back and establish new heavens and new earth. And we are living the reality of it right now. You don't have to wait till the very end. And that's what this Advent is about. Because the original story, God wanted us to know his character, his desires, his truth, his freedom, his wholeness, his joy, his love, his community, and his intimacy. That was what the garden was about. And so God wants to return to that. And he does it, it started with a Christ child who not only affected you and me, but the whole universe. And this is how we know it'll be for a while, that there's a new order and it was established by this Christ child and it was to bring those things. And so today we look at joy, the advent of joy. Now joy is interesting because you can't produce joy. You can produce happiness, you can produce pleasure, but you can't produce joy. People misunderstand that, that joy. I mean, it's kind of like when I talked about the child coming in. Did you produce that? No, you didn't. I, I can watch the faces, you know, and usually I watch my wife trying to steal that kid to bring them home, you know, and I want to make sure that doesn't happen. I've been through those stages. But there's something about people that just happens. So you can't produce joy. That's what the beauty of it is. And look at when we talk about, we sang it today, you know, and we read about it, you know, when they uh, uh, announced Jesus, I bring you tidings of great joy. Well, it wasn't like, oh, this is nice. No, it isn't. It's way beyond that. And that's what we're going to look at. It's not a feeling. Uh, It's not based on circumstances. It doesn't, if your life's going well, you have joy, and if it's going bad, you don't. Uh, That is not what it's about. You cannot make it happen, and you can't produce it. The Bible says that it's a fruit of the Spirit. Finally, joy is a gift that is given to you. That's the amazing thing about it. We talk about grace as a gift. Well, joy is also a gift. You can spread it. You can share it but you can't produce it. It's a gift from God. 
And a lot of us, you know, there's certain aspects of Christianity, peace, love, and joy, which should be the hallmarks of us, which usually aren't. You know, most Christians are impatient and, and judgmental and, and uh, you know, always stressed out because they don't feel they're good enough for God. Well, that they're not walking in the gifts that are given to them because you should be walking in peace, love, and joy that is a gift from God. That's what he wants for you, and that's what we read about, and we're going to go through here in a second. But realize it is a gift that God wants to give you. Joy is something we can have. And, and I was thinking about this. You know, at Christmas time, it can be the best of times or the worst of times. You know, if you have big family and you have relatives or you have small children or, or, you know, you have a good job or whatever it is, it can all be a great time. Most of us will have too many commitments during Christmas. You know, you got to choose this or that. But there's some people that it's the worst of times. And we know this. They're alone. They have no family. They may not have a job. They may not even have food. They may be in a war zone. We know those things. But if you really listen to the Bible, even in those midst, you can have joy. Because it's a gift. It's a gift given by God. And he's willing to give it to you in the midst of anything. Some things enhance it. Some are harder. But we're going to see that it's that type of gift. And he wants us to do this. So we go back to Isaiah. Right? Now this is the scripture really talking about John later on, about a voice in the wilderness. And Israel is in bondage. And they're going to be coming back pretty soon. So God instructs the prophet Isaiah to say, comfort, comfort my people. Let them know that their sacrifice, their sins, their pain is going to be over. Comfort them. And then he talks about making a highway or a freeway or whatever. But he doesn't say that it would be in a great place. It's in a desert. You know, when you used to bring Abdullah and Doris over to here, um, we would take them to San Francisco. We'd take them to Carmel. We took them to Disneyland. We took them to Tahoe, which they freaked out. I mean, to them, 75 degrees is freezing. So the first time we took them to Tahoe and it was like 20 degrees and they stepped out of the car, they thought they were going to die. They knew it. Uh, and so after all these things, and one day I'm talking to Abli and I said, Abli, you've been here enough. What is the most amazing thing about America to you, California, coming here from Dakar? You know what it was? The freeways. He said, I cannot believe your freeways. Well, if you've ever been to Africa, you can see why he said that. But he was amazed at the structure, these super freeways. I mean, five, six lanes each way. They'd never even heard of these things. And I thought, wow, that's amazing to me that it's a thoroughfare that affects them after they've seen these beautiful places. Well, this is what God's talking about. He said, listen, you got to make a way for this. You can't make joy happen. But you can prepare yourself for the gift. And that's what he's talking about here. And he says, clear the way for the Lord. This is a choice. Um, it's going to go through the valley. We're going to elevate the valley. We're going to level the mountains. There's going to be the splendor of the Lord revealed. All the people, he says later on, are gra like grass. And even their promises too, because that has to do with it. But the voice of the Lord is forever. Don't be afraid. The Lord comes as a victorious warrior in this scripture. His reward is with him, and he cares for them who are close to his heart. This is how he's preparing for us for this advent of joy. So this is how the joy was in the original story. It was a journey supposedly of glad tidings, of comfort and joy. So it was the best of times and the worst of times, like we said, but he wants them to understand that happiness can come. I mean, you can have happiness anyway. You can get good gifts. You can get pay raise. You can have your friends over. You can do this and make your circumstances make you happy. We all do this, folks. There's nothing wrong with being happy. 
You know, if somebody tells me they'd rather be unhappy than happy, they have a problem. I, I don't want that. I mean, I don't like pain and suffering over good health and joy. I don't like that. It happens, and we deal with it. But happiness, you can do it, but joy is not that way because joy is much deeper. It has to do with the condition that God gives you, and we have to understand that. So he's, joy will come, God says, when we learn how to comfort. And he says, Isaiah, to comfort his people. These people are in bondage. They're in the desert. They're, they're under control of another country, and God is saying, comfort each other. Well, that has never stopped. One of the great ways to have somebody experience joy is for you to comfort them. You can do that to other people. You can comfort each other. That's what we're called to do. That's what part of this new creation is, is to comfort each other. And to, first of all, from God, that you should have comfort because God is in control. See, usually people get discomfort because they think they're in control. And they try to be in control, or they feel they're totally out of control. Oh, my life's chaos. Well, it may be. But do you honestly believe that God is in control? You look at the world today, you're not going to say that. You, because we look temporal. Everything that happens right now doesn't look like that. We don't have his view. We don't understand. But if you, my life, I mean, I can look back at 50 years of being a Christian. I've seen God in control of my life. At times I have messed up, times I was rebellious, times everything else. But God has brought me here to this day, and he's in control, and I'm sure he will be. That's why he's saying, comfort my people. Let them know that this isn't about them. It isn't about you. It's about God. That's what this Advent has to do with. And then he tells them, listen, you're going to have mountains. You're going to have great times. You know, and, and sometimes the hardest thing to find joy is when everything's going right for you. People love to talk about, well, we find joy because we're suffering or we're in pain or whatever. We do. And he said there's going to be valleys, and those valleys need to be level. He's going to make a super highway. He's going to level out the whole thing. There's a story about a woman who lived in the um, hills, Appalachian Hills. She had an old car. Drove over the hill every day to church on Sunday, on Wednesdays, and Fridays. Barely made it every time. So she was talking to her pastor, and she said, uh, you know, this, this is really tough. I don't know how much longer I can do this. You know, my car overheats and stuff. And he had preached on, say grace to that mountain, and it'll be thrown into the sea. So she came up to him, and she said, you know, you said that's the word. I'm going to do it. I'm going to say grace to that mountain, and it's going to be thrown in the sea. Well, as a pastor, you know, you kind of, okay. <laughs> so, a couple years went by. Every time she came, Pastor, I'm believing that mountain's going to be thrown in the sea. Well, I won't give you the technical thing, but uh, when Jesus said that, what it really meant, but it really had to do with the architectonic center of Judaism as a religion and that we can overthrow it with faith in Christ. But she just believed. And so he finally said, listen, I've got to go over and talk to her because this is not going to happen. This mountain isn't going to disappear in the ocean. So I don't want her to be disappointed in God. So I'm going to go talk to her. So he drives over the mountain to her house. Well, by he's getting to her house, he sees this guy standing out in the road in an orange vest. And he goes, what are you doing? He said, oh, well, there's a new road going through here. We're removing this mountain. That was the end of the conversation. Because God can do that. That's the point. We don't know how or when, but let me tell you, do you think that woman had joy when she knew that she could drive through a tunnel every week? This is what we're talking about. You have to prepare yourselves for God's work to be done. She did it for a couple years, believing. And we talked about this last week. Simeon, Anna. Anna was 60 years waiting for Jesus. Simeon or Simon, how do you translate it? Uh, all he wanted to do is see you born. He said, I can depart in peace now. God, I can go. You said, yeah, I would see the, the salvation of Israel, and I've seen it, so I can go. See, they waited time and time again. Most of us don't do that. 
You know, Scott Peck talks about the great sin of humanity, especially America, is not the sin of selfishness. It's the sin of laziness. You know, we'll pray for something two or three days and then we're done. You know, we don't have time to do that. Or, uh, But God says, you know, sometimes people have prayed for 50 years for something. You know, how many people have been praying for you that may now be in glory, but they prayed for you for years? I know that happened to me, and I had that exposed to me of people praying and, and said, you know, we secure for years we prayed for you. We didn't think you could ever get saved. <laughs> They're probably up there still debating with God whether it's true, but that's okay. But he said, when we enjoy this season, we have to prepare ourselves. So we have those low times. You know, those valleys that go down the, when everything's going wrong. And it's hard to find joy because we look at joy as the absence of turmoil and confusion and frustration. You know, when all the presents are wrapped and all the cards are sent and all the bills are paid and, you know, those things. And then we say, oh, we have joy. No, that's not joy. That's happiness. And that's, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, we all want to be happy. But joy is that gift. God says, listen, what did the angel say? I bring you great tidings of joy. This baby is going to change everything. He's going to change your life. He's going to change the universe. He's going to change the cosmos. So that, and one of those gifts I'm giving you is joy. It's just like grace. You know, we all celebrate grace. We sang about it. We stand here because of grace. We're forgiven because of grace. By grace you were saved, not through works least you boast, but it's through faith, and that even not of yourself. So we all are very comfortable with the gift of grace, that we have our name written in the book of life. But how many are assured that we have a gift of joy? Now, the secret to joy not only is preparing your life, but joy always has to do, in the Old and New Testament, with wholeness. People that experience joy are free and whole and healed. You can't have bondages in your life. You can't have unforgiven sins. You can't have uh, offenses that you have taken up. You can't have traumas, unmet needs, unfulfilled dreams, as they talk about. If you've been traumatized through life and it has affected you, you cannot and will not have joy because you're not whole. And wholeness, joy is a component of wholeness. You can have little snippets. I think God will probably show us in certain areas little things. He's good at kind of getting us to move on. But it has to do with being whole. Because if you've been healed and you've been freed from insecurities, uh, self-doubt, even abuses, even when you're alone, there can be joy. You know, there's a, I think Nishi or somebody said, you know, if you're alone and you're lonely, you're in bad company. Because you should be able to be alone because you're whole. You know, when I sit there and I'm whole, I'm thinking, God, this is amazing. It's, I have joy. Why? Because you've given it to me. But I've prepared my heart for it. When I have those tough times, I go to you and say, God, I need help. When I have the good times, I go to you and I'm thankful for them. Every, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God. All of these are components of preparing your soil for joy. That's the advent, the gift. It's a gift. You know, you got to move away from that it's a feeling, that it's an experience. You know, like, oh, I feel joy because everybody's here. Well, no, you're feeling camaraderie and happiness, and that's fine. But if it's joy, it's birthed in God because he wants to give you it as a gift. This is what this is talking about. So we level the, down those programs, I mean the high times, and we take down the low ones and we lift them up, and we find that place in the Lord where he calls us to grow. We also have to be aware that those mountaintops experiences that we love to have many times can be very negative because people don't rely on God when everything's going right. 
They like to rely on God when everything's going wrong. I think one of the biggest number one prayer times for most people is when they're driving a car and red lights come on behind them. Then everybody prays. Oh, God. Oh, God, if you can get me out of this, I'm sorry. I'll do anything. You know, I'll give you my first kid. I'll, do, I'll give you my fortune. Just, you know, why? Because trouble makes us turn to God. What about, hey, God, I'm in you, man. Everything's going great, and I know it's because of you. See, that is a very key factor to your life because you can see churches. I, I read a, a statistics the other day, and they gave the nine highest states with the lowest church attendance in the United States. I thought, well, this will be interesting. California wasn't even in them. Believe it or not, California wasn't even in the top ten for the lowest mainly because a lot of it is because of immigrants, uh, Catholics coming here. So they go to church. The lowest was Vermont. So, but they were saying, because people have gotten busy and, and they think that that is more important than, I mean, it's not that you have to go to church to be a Christian. I'm not down that road, but I'm just saying it is a place for worshiping God. It's, it shows an importance in our life, preparing our hearts that's why we have a confession. We're preparing our hearts for a work of God. You should be doing that every day, saying, God, I want to be whole and I want to be healed, especially the healing part. I, I, don't, I can't stress that enough. The more you become whole, the more the soil is prepared for God to give you joy. It really is. Because people can talk about joy. People can talk about happiness. People can talk about peace, you know, and, and oh, I'm saved by grace and all that stuff. But I believe that God looks on people that says, you know, I'm really pleased in you because you've sought me to heal you. And when you've sought me to heal you, you've opened up the channel between me and you even broader so more gifts can flow. That's what I want from you. And so th that's what he talks about. So Isaiah tells us we are like grass. And others, and even their promises. How many of us have been hurt? How many of us have been frustrated and disappointed because of people, because of promises? They're going to let you down, man. If your joy is coming from other people, you're in trouble because they're going to let you down. You let yourself down all the time. That's the point. The beauty of it is you got to get over that to realize it's a gift. God wants to give you. But we get frustrated because people have hurt us. I read an article the other day by a doctor, and he said the worst um, hurts come from church people to other church people. Those are the hardest to get over. When people who are supposed to be Christians and, and loving and caring lie to you and deceive you and, and give false promises. I, I see this all the time, especially because we don't want to disappoint somebody, so we don't tell them the truth. Oh, are you coming to this? Oh, yeah, I, I can't wait for it. When you know darn well you're not going, but you don't want to say, oh, I'm not coming, and they'll be disappointed. But he's, Isaiah, through the prophet, he's telling them, listen, this is going to happen. This doesn't have anything to do with joy. It, it's real. People disappoint you. People make you happy. People elevate your life. They make it wonderful. But they can't make it joyful. Only God can. So he talks about that. And he says, the voice of the Lord is forever. When God says, I bring you joy, it's forever. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He, it's a gift he wants to give. So because of that, he ends up in Isaiah by saying, we don't have to be afraid because we're being protected, accepted, loved, we're secure, we're new creation, and we're changed day by day. Because of this, the love of God gave his son. That's why the Orthodox celebrated. Why? Why? Jesus said, or God, and the Trinity said, listen, long before the earth was created, there will become a time when I'm going to have to show my love, and Jesus, eventually you're going to have to show your love by being sacrificed. But the way I'm going to show my love is by giving you as a child. 
For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Who shall ever believe in him shall not perish. That was the greatest act of love for God giving because Jesus had the option in certain terms of not doing what he was supposed to do. We can talk about peccability and peccability, but Jesus willingly, what did we read today? Jesus went to the cross joyfully. Now, how in the world would somebody go to a cross joyfully? It is one of the worst deaths you can experience. I mean, you can read the reports, and I know doc, medical doctors have written about it, the pain, the excruciating pain, the, the torture. I mean, he, they suffocate because they can't lift themselves up. So why in the world would the Son of God, who created the heavens and the earth, go to the cross joyfully? doesn't make any sense. It only makes sense when you realize it's because of you. God saw you as you should be and can be for eternity. And that was the joy he saw. He said, this is worth it. When I look at you, you don't see it yet, but I do. I see who you are. I see who you were ordained to be, what your legacy is. And I want to do everything I can to do it. So what I've got to give now will be multiplied in billions of people knowing the truth of who God is. That was the love of Jesus. So he gave the joy because of his, uh, he, he was a victorious warrior they talk about in Isaiah. He's already won the future. We see it. New heavens, new earth. It was written in the Old Testament. It's in Revelation, okay? He's the presence of the Lord is a reward that he brings to you. He's joy. That's what he said. I'm, well, we'll see at the very end. He releases his Holy Spirit. He said, I'm bringing you gifts. So we rest in this truth that he cares about us. He keeps us close to his heart. Remember the joy of the Lord is the gladness of heart. That's what it is. If your heart is glad, it's because of joy. Even though you can be burdened and you can be sad, there's nothing wrong. Life is like that. You know, when we do funerals, one of the things I most often say is the reason you're sad is because you loved. If you didn't love the person so much, you wouldn't be that sad. But the more you love, the more sadness. It's two sides of a coin. So at the end, you can't make it happen, but you need to prepare the word, the way of the Lord. Get ready, your heart, every day, do that. So now we jump to the New Testament real quickly. There's a parable in Matthew 25, which will kind of help you understand this. And it's the parable of the talents. And this rich guy is going away, and he calls his servants in. And he said, I'm going away, and I'm going to give you some money. And you can do with it, you know, basically what you want until I come back. Okay, so... A talent is between six and 10,000 denarii. So I'm going to use 10,000 as the thing. A denarii is a day's wage. So basically, he gave the first guy a talent of 27 years of salary times five. So 136 years of your salary. That's money, folks. I don't care how much money you made while you worked. If you had 136 years of it, you'd probably have a really happy retirement. I would. He gives the other guy 82 years, and then the last guy, he gives 27 years. And he goes away, and he comes back. So when he comes back, this is what he found. The first guy, the five, you know what he does. He makes five. Here are three things that are very important about him. First of all, he moved out immediately. He took action. He didn't sit around for, uh, we don't know how long the guy was gone, but he didn't sit around for weeks thinking, well, I wonder what I should do. No, he said immediately, I'm going to do something about it. When I tell you about preparing your heart, that's what you need to do. If you want joy in your life, you've got to take action. You've got to do stuff that is going to make your heart prepared for receiving the gifts and the talents of the Lord. Now, we all have the same gift in salvation. We all have the same gift in eternity. But we don't have the same gifts in our lives. 
Many of you got 10 talents. Some of you got one talent. Uh, some of you are still looking for what you think your talent is. God gives as he wants. Uh, we have no control over that. But you should find out what they are. His gifts and callings are without repentance, the Bible says. You should know what your gifts are. But this guy said, I'm going to go out. So he moved out, and what did he do? He went to work. He didn't just go out willy-nilly and do nothing. He said, no, i got to figure out a plan. I'm going to make this work. I'm going to, what is it, plan, plan your work and work your plan, okay? So he did something about it. People will come to me and they'll, in counseling and they'll say, you know, I'm just really dry. Uh, the Lord's far away, and I, you know, sometimes I wonder whether I'm saved or not. You know, I, I need deliverance or something. I said, no, probably not. But I will ask you this. Do you pray? Do you read the Bible? Do you have fellowship? Do you worship? And I'll tell, guarantee you, 90% of the time, it's one of those or all of them. You got to work it. It's not, you're, sa you're saved by grace, but your relationship, we all know if you've been married, takes work. It just doesn't happen. The same thing with God. You want to have a good relationship? You hear people say, well, how come they hear from God and I don't? I don't know. How much time have you spent trying to hear his voice? How much time have you learned the word to know when his voice is right and wrong? you got to work it. It's, I'm sorry. There's no simple way. You can't just say, oh, I'm saved by grace. Okay, you're saved. That means someday you're going to be, you know, you're going to live forever. I'm happy with that. But if you want the here and now to be joyful and productive and hearing from God and seeing God, you got to work it. He gives you instructions. And it's not based on guilt or whether you're smart enough or rich enough or anything. It's just based on, do you spend time with God? You all know this in your life. People you spend time with, you know the best. It's a simple thing as that. So he wants you to work it. And then the last thing was he won. You know, he not only went out and worked, he did the work, but he won. Because he did the work. God wants you to win, folks. That should be settled right from now. God doesn't want you to fail. God doesn't want you to be frustrated. God doesn't want you to struggle like, am I good enough? Or how come other people hear from God and I don't hear? God doesn't want that. You, I, I, I've been studying this for 50 years, people. I can tell you this. God wants you to succeed. My plans for you are good. That's what God wants for you. But most of the time, he said, the reason they're not good is because you're not spending enough time with me to find out what my plans are. And I guarantee you, one of the greatest plans you'll ever have is the joy of the Lord. It says that salvation is joy unspeakable. What is that? Have you ever felt so joyful you couldn't even explain it? Well, that's what God says he wants for you. So he got that. And so when the guy comes home, he calls them together. And you know what happened. Hey, how'd you do? Ah, great. I took your 127 years of salary, and I made 127 years of salary more. Ooh, good boy. Come in with me. I'm, I'm going to give you more. He went to the three person. He said, how'd you do? I did great. I mean, I didn't do as good as him, but I got three you gave me three, I used that. Because both of them used 100% of their gift. That's the answer. It wasn't how many gifts they had. It was they used their gift. Okay. Come on in. I'm going to do it. Comes the one guy. How'd you do? Oh, well, you know, I, I know you're kind of mean. I know you kind of sow where you shouldn't sow. And I know all these things about you, so I hid it. You what? I hid it. So you could get, so I, I was scared. So I wanted to make sure you got back your one talent. He goes, you're worthless, lazy. I mean, he's really harsh with the guy. Because he said, you know, I gave you this gift. What did you do with the gift? You buried it? He never answers the accusations. He never says, oh, yeah, I steal where I want to and I cheat on my tax. He never answers any of that stuff. He just said, this, that's not the point because we all want excuses. You know, Adam started it. It wasn't my fault. It was the woman you gave me. I wouldn't eat the apple, but it's her fault. 
you know, and it goes down and down and it's still down. Well, God, you know, I could probably do more for the church or uh, Christianity if I was smarter, if I went to college, uh, if I had more money, if I was younger, if I was older, if I was thinner, if I was richer, if I was better looking, whatever the excuse is, we always have an excuse for not doing what we should do. God says, I will not give you things above what you are able to do. I'm not asking you to go out and run, want, win the Olympics. I'm asking you to do what I gave you to do. And I've given you everything you need to participate in the divine nature. Everything you need, I've given to you. So he said, so he have him cast out in darkness and takes it away from him. And you go, whoa, that's harsh. There's a reason for it. He ends up and he says, it seems strange that in the kingdom, people who are the most active seem to have the most opportunities. Wow, when you tell about your life, Dennis, you, you've done all these things, gone all these places. Yeah. Why? Because I did them. I used my gifts. God blessed them. I didn't sit home. And God says, too much is given, much is required. But he said to these people, I'm going to give you more. That's what your reward is. So when you work these things and you spend more time with God, guess what? God's just going to give you a more desire to be with him. He's going to give you a more desire to hear his voice. He's going to give you more desire, and he's going to fulfill those things. That's what the, gift, the talents are. So if you want to talk about joy, it has to do with, with using your talents, preparing your soil, saying, God, this is what you've given me. I don't know fully what they are. It changes over years. Don't try to figure out one thing you do. But if you're diligent and responsible and committed to spend time with God, to prepare your soil, to comfort, God, I want to be comforted. But I don't want to be comforted with kind words. I want to be comforted with your presence. Because there is nothing greater in the universe than your presence. And I get your presence by spending time with you. And so I will prepare myself for heart. So at the very end, Jesus says these things. And until not you have, you don't have because you ask for them. But if you ask anything my name and you will receive it so that your joy may be complete. Whoa. You don't have joy complete because you aren't asking and you're not believing. Romans 14 says, For the kingdom of God does not consist of food and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. John 15, 11, I have told you these things so, they, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Whoa, Jesus is telling you, I'm, I'm sharing all these things with you so your joy can be complete. I'm giving you my joy. Do you know how much joy Jesus has? If you correlate joy to the presence of God, Jesus and God are one. So his joy would have to be perfect all the time. And he says, I'm giving you my joy. You don't have to work it up. It isn't about you. It's about me. And I'm giving it to you so your joy can be complete. John 17, 13 says, But now I am coming to you, and I am saying these things in the world, that they may experience my joy and completeness in themselves. Jesus said, that's why I came. One of them. So we celebrate joy. We pray for joy. We work with God in his gifts through Jesus so that we prepare our own hearts through the Holy Spirit, so we would be in the kingdom, that it would increase, and joy would cover the earth, it says. When we realize that this Advent is about joy this week. And Jesus says this, finally, for everyone 
who has will be given more. And they will have an abundance. Jesus says this. You want more joy? Spend time with me. You don't earn it. You don't achieve it. You don't make it happen. But it comes from me because my desire is that you have complete joy. My joy. But it will come when you spend time with me and you're healed. Let's pray. God, when we celebrate your advent, you come, you, we are just so amazed at all that you have done. I mean, you're talking about way back in Isaiah, you're already talking about comforting your people and making the path straight that John the Baptist fulfilled. And he made the way straight for the person to come that would bring joy and peace and love and hope, and that is you. As a child, as a lifestyle, as a sacrifice on the cross, because God so loved us, the Trinity so loved us, that he came, that our joy would be complete because we would have the complete joy of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay. I don't know who we have. George is not here. We have Teresa. Excellent. Does anybody have something they want to share, a praise or a prayer? Uh, there's one up here, Teresa. There's one over there, too. Hmm. This is Bob Fitch. Uh, I had another example of your sermon before the sermon, Dennis. Uh, this morning I was getting coffee for Carol and I over at the bagel place over by Stan's Donuts. And this lady that I've encountered before her knows that I was, I'm a Christian. <laughs> and I had a very interesting conversation because part of it was about joy. And I was explaining the difference between joy and happiness to her. So I also, God gave me a gift of a poem that I would like to share. Uh, oops. <laughs> Know my joy indescribable. Open yourself to know who I am. To truly know, I must refine you. Burn all your dross for intimate intimacy. I wrote that before you wrote, before you spoke any of the sermon. Okay. Amen. Uh, Teresa, I, Kathy, pause up here. Well, it's official. We're moving Whoa. three and a half miles from here. <laughs> so you're still my church. Um, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you being my church. And um, we need prayer. Um, my husband, uh, through his uh, psychiatrist, has been uh, told that he's got dementia. And he's struggling with uh, this move. Uh, pray for that. That's coming in February, um, probably February 1st, around in that neighborhood. Uh, we're moving to where Sunuk was, which is Villa Serena. And I'm very excited about this because it's like walking into another world. Because it's so lush with greenery in there. You feel like you're just, oh, I walked out of uh, the city into the country. And so I, we're looking for, I'm looking forward to this. I'm hoping my husband is too. Please pray for him. Uh, he's going to be tested on uh, Tuesday, um, actually Wednesday, and uh, to see what's actually going on with him. We, we want that um, in writing so we, you know, we know. And uh, anyway, um, I just, I love the Lord for his comfort, but I also love this church for all your comfort. Thank you. Amen. Any Zoomers? And from the deep dark hole? No. Okay. Well, the Lord 
always has a blessing for us, no matter where we go, where we are, what season in our lives. So let us stand and sing the blessing as we start off this week. Okay, whether you're ready or not, next Sunday is Christmas Eve. So we hope you all come. We have two services. I know for some that'll be a stretch, but uh, the six o'clock service is always a special service. When I came here 28 years ago, one of the things they did was sing Silent Night with candles at the end. It was a tradition that was long before me. And it's one of my favorite times to end that service singing that. And, and I hope you can invite your friends. It's a little different service in the morning, but uh, it'll be a great time next Sunday night. So we would hope to see you all there. And then next Sunday, and, and hopefully if you're leaving town, that you have a great holiday. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. We And be back in the new year with us. And we just pray for God's joy to be on you. Let's pray. God, we know that your face does shine upon us and you do bless us beyond measure. And you want to bless us more because just being in your presence is the most amazing blessing we can receive. And so let us prepare our hearts, prepare our soil for your gifts and your wonderment and your forgiveness and your joy and your peace. We thank you for each other. Help us to comfort each other, encourage each other, and be light to the world. In your name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.